Hello, I'm your host, Luke, and today we'll be talking about the Carol A. Deering at John on January 31st, 1921, from the lookout perch at the U.S. Coast Guard's Cape Hatteras Station. Surfman C.P. Brady peered out at the morning fog and spied a dark shape out on the shallow waters of Diamond Shoals, which, together with the other shoals off the Outer Banks was known for claiming ships and earned the area of the Sobriquet, the graveyard of the Atlantic. But there had also been another name among native tribes for this particular island, now called Hatteras, name listeners should recognize, that it had once been called Croatone by its inhabitants. This morning, surfman Brady squinted into the mist, unsure if his eyes were playing tricks on him in the light and the morning's brumous haze, but as the mist receded, there could be no mistaking it. Somehow in a night, a schooner had bottomed down on a sandbar of the Diamond Shoals, despite the clear warning from the nearby Cape Hatteras light atop the black and white spiral stripes of its lighthouse tower, and what's more, she looked as to be a magnificent vessel, 250 feet from stem to stern, all told with five grand masts and all its sails set. It must have been quite the sight, a relic from a bygone era <coughs> bringing out of the fog and the past. When the news of the shipwreck went out from the Coast Guard station, it was acted on by local boatmen, for there were many in that region who stood ready at a moment's notice to plunge into the choppy waters where, when a ship had run aground. First there was the life-saving service, which had stationed seven miles apart up and down the coast of the Outer Banks, and had men marching the beaches on constant watch for ships in distress, none of which sentries had managed to spy the five-masted schooner out on the shoals. Then there were the wreckers, those who would have sought to salvage anything aboard the schooner, before the waves that had scuttled it battered it to pieces. This was, after all, not far south of Nag's Head, where there was a long tradition of wreckers or bankers who would lure ships ashore and strip them of goods. Those still at the family business in the 1920s, of course, were of a decidedly less practical bent, but they'd still make all haste to a ship that had foundered on the shoals the seas, however, proved too rough for any of these lifesavers and wreckers and even for the Coast Guard cutters that were eventually dispatched to the wreck and none could approach any closer than a quarter mile to the ship. When finally, days l later, the tugboat rescue captain by James Carlson was able to board the schooner, it had been so battered by the sea that it was taking on water its fore and aft decks rolling independently of one another, which he th crashed of the waves. And they made a search of her and found no one aboard unless one counted the starved and mewling ship's cats. And as in the stories of the Mary Celeste, a meal had been prepared. There were ribs in a pan, pea soup in a pot, and coffee on the stove. Unlike that other ghost ship, though, there were clear signs of the ship's abandonment, and the ladder was hanging over the side and its lifeboats were gone. There had been a dory and a motorized yawl, and their fails had been simply cut as if to abandon the ship in haste. Moreover, all the crew's belongings had been taken, as had the nautical instruments, her sextant and chronometer and telescope and the ship's papers. And oddly in the head or the toilet area, Captain Carlson found the ship's charts strewn about, and elsewhere, the wheel had been shattered. The rudder disengaged from its stock, and the binnacle box staved in and broken. A sledgehammer leaned ominously near at hand, but Carlson could not tell if it had been utilized as an instrument of sabotage or a tool of repair. Further evidence also suggested that the schooner had not been in working order even before it had foundered on the shoal, for both of its anchors were gone, 
and it seemed that the ship had simultaneously been sailing off with her running lights and her emergency lights lit as all were burned out. The latter two red lights situated high up in the rigging were signals meant to indicate an out-of-control vessel. In the days after he was finally able to board the schooner, wreckers salvaged what they could for auction, which wasn't much, and some cells that could still be reused, some furniture, and as it continued to be battered against the shoal by the relentless ocean, it was eventually declared to be a menace to the navigation of other ships, and there was an order put out to dynamite her, and most sources say that it was done. At least one version gives a far more dramatic ending, certain that even as the Coast Guard cutters put out to sea with the explosives to carry out these orders, a sudden storm whipped up and finally shattered the ghost ship. Either way, she was certainly reduced to a patch of debris and timbers floating far and wide to wash ashore up and down the outer banks. And somewhere among that flotsam could likely be seen the transom, the Carol A. Deering. So now we go into some sightings of the ship. On August 1920, five months before the schooner was discovered, the Carol A. Deering set folk sail from Norfolk, Virginia in tip-top shape with an experienced captain and a crew of 10 men bound for Rio de Janeiro with a cargo of coal. The ship departed on August 22nd. The ship delivered its sail and cargo on schedule and set sail to return in December. A lightship keeper aboard the Cape Lookout Lightship in North Carolina sighted the vessel bound for its home port on January 29, 1921, and the ship had lost its anchors, and Captain Johnson took note of this, but was unable to report it due to his radio being out. He would later describe the crew of the Carol A. Deering, quote, milling around suspiciously on the fore deck of the ship. Two days later, on the morning of January 31st, C.P. Brady spied the schooner of ground and helpless on Diamond Shoals, its sails still set and its lifeboats missing, with rough waters uh, kept surf boats from reaching the wreck until February... Wait. Yeah. So the ship had been abandoned. The crew had vanished like ghosts, and gone with them were personal belongings, key navigational equipment, some papers, and the ship's anchors. Despite an exhaustive investigation by the FBI, no trace of the crew or the ship's logs has ever been uncovered. So, some theories that were created as to why it was abandoned were that there's bootlegging, hurricanes, piracy, aliens, and an insubordinate crew that were some of the theories uh, suggested, but... Um, one of the main ones is that it was caused by the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle, right? Um, there was an investigation opened by the Justice Department. And the Secretary of Commerce, President Herbert Hoover, were placed in charge of the investigation. They determined that the sulfur freighter Hewitt and other ships had disappeared in the same area. However, many of the crafts were sailing near a large hurricane. Ritchie tried to trace the route from its last sighting at Cape Lookout to running aground at Diamond Shoals using logs of the Coast Guard light ships and determined that the Hewitt and Deering must have been sailing away from the area of the storms. An FBI agent went to Dare County in July 1921 and asked local Coast Guardsmen if they believed the crew had mutinied an abandoned ship and one Captain Balance of the Cape Hatteras Station said the coastline was too jagged for lifeboats to land. Quote, I believe they abandoned her after taking everything of value and ran her up in the shoals intentionally. Now, Wormel's problems with first mate McClellan were well documented at their stop in Rio de Janeiro. And Captain Jacobson at Cape Lookout knew the man 
who held his ship was not Captain Warmel, nor was he an officer, and the investigation was closed in late 1922 with no answers ever given. But either mutiny or pirates were assumed to be the cause. I mean, what I just read makes it sound like it was mutiny. Because they didn't recognize the captain. As they held the ship, right? Uh, that's my guess. This has been your host, Luke. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe for more. Hope you have a good night. Thanks for watching.